It is now time for oral questions. I recognize the Leader of His Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Spe uh, speaker, my uh, question is for the Premier. Yesterday, newly uncovered documents provided even more evidence that it was a conservative, it was conservative political staff, not civil service experts, who directed changes to municipal official plans that favoured very specific land speculators in Niagara, Hamilton, Halton, Waterloo, Peel, York, Durham regions. It's clearer than ever that the Premier was looped into decisions regarding urban boundary changes from the start. So, Speaker, I have to ask the Premier, were these specific changes made to benefit the Premier's friends, just like the decision to remove sites from the Greenbelt? Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Speaker. Actually, last week, uh, when uh, I reversed uh, the official plans. I acknowledge that uh, there was, in fact, uh, too much uh, um, involvement of uh, political staff in those uh, official plans, and that is why I removed or I, uh, I revoked the official plans and went back to the original plans as submitted by the regions. The supplementary question. Speaker, it's very obvious that the Premier's office was more involved in all of these decisions than they've disclosed. As we start to dig, <laughs> Former Minister of Housing's Chief of Staff Ryan Amato didn't mince words. He directed senior ministry staff to, and I quote, keep their mouths shut about the changes. These revelations bring the Premier and the former Minister's testimony to the Integrity Commissioner into question. So, Speaker, why is there such a discrepancy between the Premier's testimony to the Integrity Commissioner and what's revealed in these documents? Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Yeah, Mr. Mr. Speaker, as I said uh, at the news conference last uh, last week, uh, I thought there was uh, too much uh, involvement uh, with from political staff in the, in the foreign minister's office, and uh, that is why I repealed uh, the changes that the province had made uh, to those official plans uh, and rein, uh, reinstated uh, the official plans as submitted uh, uh, by the regions. I acknowledge that uh, last week. At the same time, we're going to continue focusing, uh, working with our our partners, our municipal partners, to make sure that we get uh, houses. Uh, uh, shovels in the ground and homes built for the people of the province of Ontario. The final supplementary. It's just an accident, right? A one-off. No. Speaker, the Premier told the Integrity Commissioner that he had, quote, no recollection of meeting developer Sergio Mancha about removing his lands from the Greenbelt. The Premier repeated that just this morning. But the documents uncovered yesterday, they tell a very different story. In fact, they indicate that the Premier did meet with Mr. Mancia on September 20, 2021, with the same Mr. Mancia, whose staff members said the Premier, quote, needs to stop calling. <laughs> Speaker, I'm going to ask again, why is there such a discrepancy between what the Premier testified to the Integrity Commissioner and the revelations in these documents? Members will please take their seats. Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Speaker, uh, I said quite clearly, and I've answered it a number of, of times, that there was too much involvement uh, from political staff in changes to the official plans, and that is why I repealed the changes that were made by the, by the, uh, uh, by the province in the official plans and why I reinstated the official plans as submitted by those 12 municipalities. Uh, there was too much involvement. I repealed them. I'm working with uh, municipalities. Uh, uh, to ascertain which of the changes they may support uh, over the next uh, 45 days, uh, uh, Speaker. But I, I have acknowledged right from the beginning there was too much uh, input uh, from political staff. We have a provincial policy statement, and that's what we should be guided by, and that's what we will continue to be guided by as we build 1.5 million homes working with our municipal partners to get that job done. Thank you. Next question. Once again, the Leader of the Opposition. Ontarians are growing increasingly concerned that this government doesn't understand the gravity of the situation they're in. Back to the Premier. They're under a criminal RCMP investigation. Apparently, interviews are going to start this week. They've appointed Order. a special prosecutor. The Integrity Commissioner and the Auditor General had to do comprehensive probes in order for the public to get a sense of the scale of this government's dirty deals. This goes so far beyond the Greenbelt. 
We've seen a clear pattern of preferential treatment benefiting the private interests of a select few landowners over and over and over again. So, Speaker, to the Premier, how can Ontarians trust this government when a mountain of evidence shows they're only in it for their friends? Premier. Well, I'll tell the Leader of the Opposition why they can trust us. You can look at the economy, the 700,000 people that are working today that weren't working five years ago. Then you can look at the housing starts, record housing starts and rental starts over 30 years. We look at the infrastructure, building the highways and the roads and the bridges and the transit. We're spending $70 billion on transit, $30 billion on, on roads. And when it comes to MZOs, Mr. Speaker, there's 234,000 people that have a roof over their head today that wouldn't have a roof over their head. There's 5,000 seniors that can call long-term care home because the MZOs that were asked by Order. the municipalities to do. There's 150,000 construction jobs that happen because of those MZOs. It's a tool that we aren't going to stop using. We're going to continue building homes. The 1.5 million homes, uh, that's our our target we're going to continue doing supplementary question that's his alibi yeah. we have 7,000 pages of evidence 7,000 pages of evidence 7,000 more reasons that Ontarians have to question this government's integrity everything in there points to the premier and his staff directing policy changes to favor specific speculators with ties to the conservative party in one instance, in Hamilton, this government copied a developer's exact request into Hamilton's official plan, word for word. To the Premier, who runs this province? Is it the Premier, or has he outsourced the job to his speculator friends? Order. Order. To reply, the Premier. Do you know who runs this province? The people of this province run it. The people that elected this with two massive majorities. I always say Parliament is supreme. And what is Parliament? Parliament is elected by the people. So the people are supreme. They tell us what they want. We ran on a very clear mandate. Building homes, building roads, building highways, building long-term care homes, building hospitals. And the reason we have to do this, Mr. Speaker, because the Liberals for 15 years, supported and propped it up by the NDP, destroyed this province, basically put it into bankruptcy, and we came in and saved the people and saved the province. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The final supplementary. Whew, speaker, uh, this Premier and his minister testified under oath that they did not know about the changes to the Greenbelt until late October 2022. Yet now we have pages and pages of redactions due to cabinet confidentiality from September and early October. These redactions seriously call into question the accuracy of the Premier's testimony. We know that the Premier's former minister, principal secretary, director of housing policy, all conveniently provided the integrity commissioner with the same incorrect dates when they were living it up in Vegas with a greenbelt speculator. So, Speaker, to the Premier, why is the Premier's cabinet sitting on their hands while he is clearly giving preferential treatment to his insider friends? Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Just the opposite, Speaker. We're not sitting on our hands. In fact, we are getting the job done across the province of Ontario. You know, she talks about uh, she talks about municipal zoning, uh, uh, minister zoning orders. The premier talked about it. Uh, minister zoning orders will ensure that we have the largest long-term care home in the country built in Mississauga. You know what else it'll mean? It'll mean the largest hospital in the country in Mississauga. So the leader of the opposition would like us to close down 600 beds for seniors. She'd like us to stop construction of the largest hospital in the country. She'd like us to put down the shovels on the social housing that is being built within the city of Toronto. She would like us to stop the subways that are being built. She would like us to stop the GO trains that are, are being built across the province of Ontario. And she would like us to stop building homes for people of the province of Ontario who have one dream, Speaker. The dream is to come to this uh, province, or if you're already here, to get out of your parents' base basement so that you can have the same dream as everybody else. We won't stop. We'll get the next
question. Once again, the Leader of the Opposition. S Speaker, the jig is up. The jig is up. This should be a moment of very sober Order. reflection for this government, and instead they're doubling down. This question is for the Premier. From official plans to the Green Belt to MZOs, we have a chaotic and speculator-friendly process driven by the Premier and his political staff. When discussing the Cherrywood lands owned by Silvio de Gasparis, Mr. Amato is quoted in these FOI documents saying the government should just do what they asked for. At another point, Mr. Amato says the speculator is getting an, and I quote, unfrozen $3 billion asset. Whoa. On another point, he says the process needs to look, quote, as clean as possible. <laughs> Speaker, if Ontarians can't trust this government's testimony under oath, why should anyone believe them at all? Premier. Mr. Speaker, when it comes to the official plans, there's thousands and thousands and thousands of changes. This has been going on for decades, even when I was down at the municip municipality. And when I directed the Minister of Housing to pull those back, we're going to work hand in hand. And as sure as I'm standing here, Mr. Speaker, the municipalities are going to come back and they're going to ask for more changes. And God bless them for asking for changes because that means we're going to be building homes. Do you know what I find ironic, Mr. Speaker? No matter if it's the MZO or OPs or whatever, guess who shows up to all the announcements? The NDP shows up to the announcements standing beside me when we're announcing a long term care home. Order. It's happened numerous times. But I find it very ironic they vote against it. But they want to take the kudos when we actually get the long-term care homes built. Yep. Here it is. Supplementary. Speaker, the Premier can't continue to claim ignorance about this. This is embarrassing. Yeah. We, now, uh, we now know that he had a meeting regarding the Greenbelt on September 15th. We have a note from October 13th saying that the decision on the York Region area is, quote, with the Premier's office right now, but, quote, the Premier doesn't understand it's in the Oak Ridge's moraine. In document after document, we have quotes like, they're bringing it to the PO in conversation with PO. And PO, by the way, in case anybody doesn't already know, is the Premier's office. On October 26th, the minister wanted to rip off the Green Belt Band-Aid and hope developers don't, and I quote, stab them in the back. Ooh. Speaker, so back to the Premier. If this Question. is how the Premier's office conducts business, when is the Premier going to come clean about his role in these shady backroom deals? To reply, Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Speaker, listen, this is uh, no different. This is an NDP that is literally opposed to everything. The Leader of the Opposition is sitting next to a member whose own riding, his own riding depends on mining, and yet he sits in his place and laughs because he knows he voted against miners and thousands of jobs. Behind her is a member who relies on schools and, and, uh, and, and colleges and universities, and that's a member who votes against in student housing, Mr. Speaker. On the opposite side is a member who votes against long-term care in his riding every single day, but as the Premier said, shows up to the announcements and says, oh, I want to help you cut the ribbon to something that I oppose every single time, Mr. Speaker. Surrounding the Leader of the Opposition are members who vote against housing, they vote against transit and transportation in their riding. It is a caucus that is divided, and the Leader of the Opposition will do anything to distract Spots. from the divisions in her own caucus. We will move forward on building a bigger, better, stronger province of Ontario because that's what the people need, and we won't let them down. Order. Order. The next question, the member for Thornhill. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Finance. When meeting with local businesses in my riding of Thornhill, I've heard time and time and again of the pressure the federal carbon tax is putting on our economy and especially on our local commerce. So starting a grow and growing a business is hard work. 
All businesses play a vital role in our province's economy. While the opposition Liberals and the NDP have no problem with the aggressive carbon tax, it's not fair or right that our businesses are being punished. Speaker, can the minister please explain what impact a carbon tax has on our economy and our businesses? To reply, the Minister of Finance. Well, thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the hardworking member from Thornhill for that great question. You know, their local business owners are absolutely right. The carbon tax is driving up costs and making life more expensive for the people of this great province. Mr. Speaker, in fact, a recent study by the Canadian Federation of Independent Business found that more than 56 per cent of businesses would need to increase their prices immediately due to direct pressures from the carbon tax. That means that it's not just on the carbon tax, Mr. Speaker, it's a tax on the truck, uh, truck drivers who bring in our food. It's a tax on the farmers who grow our crops, and it's a tax on the local businesses that try to succeed in Ontario. Mr. Speaker, it's not fair for the people of this province Order. Uh, to continue with this punitive carbon tax, and that's why we will continue to fight against the carbon tax, even as the Liberals and the NDP opposition members Bonds. continue to vote to make life more expensive for Ontario families. Supplementary question, the member for Thornhill. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the equally hardworking minister. Uh, the carbon tax harms health and wellness and progress of Ontarians. The regressive tax adds an artificial barrier to the affordability of essential items. It forces small businesses to increase prices, making them less competitive, and it places an unfair burden on our producers. So Ontario companies are struggling every day to stay competitive and viable in a global market due to high inflation. In this time of economic uncertainty and affordability concerns, let's not tax Ontarians more. Unlike the opposition, Liberals and NDP, our government believes in putting money back into the pockets of people by removing this harmful tax. Yep. Can the minister please share his views on why we need to fight this carbon tax and provide support to Ontario businesses and families? Yes. And thank you to the great member again from Thornhill for that question. As the member so clearly outlined, the carbon tax continues to drive up prices and make life more unaffordable. And I was really disappointed to see that the Liberal opposition members and the NDP members voted against our motion to remove the carbon tax from grocery items. That's why, Speaker, I was proud to have stood alongside the Premier today to announce that our government is once again taking action to support hardworking Ontario families and businesses by extending our gas tax cut. If passed, Mr. Speaker, the 2023 fall economic statement will extend the gas tax cut to June 30, 2024, saving households an average of $260, Mr. Speaker. Response. And Mr. Speaker, this is just one more cost-saving measure championed by our government, putting money back in the pockets of Ontario families at a time when they need it most. The next question. Member for University Rosedale. Speaker, my question is to the Premier. According to FOI documents at a meeting on October 13, 2022, staff discussed the removal of Gormley land from the Greenbelt. In a meeting note, Ryan Amato said the decision on the Gormley Greenbelt lands was with the Premier's office. I quote Amato, Premier doesn't understand it's in the Oak Ridges moraine, unquote. My question is to the Premier. Did you make the decision to remove these Gormley lands from the Greenbelt? Yes or no? Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Uh, Speaker, uh, Gormley lands were never removed uh, from the Greenbelt. I know that quite well because it is in my riding. I actually uh, uh, begrudgingly uh, campaigned in two elections to remove the Gormley lands from the Greenbelt because the town of Stouffville is having such a difficult time raising the funds needed uh, uh, to. Uh, uh, with respect to um, unfunded liabilities, with respect to infrastructure, because it is entirely green belted. But the premier, on both occasions, told me it's not happening and rejected those uh, that green belt expansion. 
supplementary question. The member for Waterloo. Thank you uh, again to the Premier. At a subsequent meeting on October 21, 2022, Ministry staff met to discuss outstanding issues related to certain Greenbelt properties. These properties included the Gormley Greenbelt lands in York Region. According to the meeting note, Ryan Amato said, and I quote, they're bringing it to the Premier's office. Two weeks later, these Greenbelt lands were designated for development in the Ministry's amendments to the York Region's official plan. They got what they wanted. The Premier previously claimed he was not made aware of the changes to the Greenbelt prior to the Cabinet briefing on October 27th. We all remember this very well. Would the Premier, out of respect for the people of Ontario, like to correct his record? Take your seats. Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Again, uh, again uh, Mr. Speaker, the Gormley lands were not included. Question the member for Brantford Brant. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Indigenous Affairs and Northern Development. The carbon tax is making everything more expensive for all of Ontarians, and especially those in Northern Ontario. The reality is, is that because of northern geography, the cost of transporting goods is already much higher than it would be in any other part of the province. The north is a vast land where many individuals have to travel by car, and in many cases, larger vehicles are needed for safety due to the many back roads and the unpredictable weather conditions. The carbon tax is negatively impacting people in these communities as they are hit hardest by the, at the gas pumps and in their grocery stores. Speaker, can the minister please elaborate on his views regarding the negative impact that the carbon tax has on Northern Ontario? Thank you. Order. Minister of Northern Development. Mr. Oh, Mr. Speaker, because he's proud to stand with two leaders, Prime Minister Harper and Premier Ford, who've taken a hard-line stance against the carbon tax. Mr. Speaker, there's no place in this province where that cost has had a greater burden. Think, Mr. Speaker, for a moment when the Dryden Eagles want to play the Fort Francis Muskies. There's 185 or 200 kilometers. It's hockey, it's basketball, badminton, all those sports, Mr. Speaker. Think of how much more money those schools have to pay to play each other. Gas, Mr. Speaker, is already more expensive up in Northern Ontario. That 14 cents a litre is a big hit. But let's talk about energy, mining, and forestry. A recent study at the University of Waterloo says this is a hit to Canada for $256 billion, forestry, mining, and energy combined. As one of the largest producers in those three spaces or users, Ontario is exposed in three of its primary drivers for our economy, Mr. Speaker. Bonds. It's time to scrap this tax. The supplementary question. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you, Minister. The carbon tax is, in essence, a tax on everything. Your groceries, your gas, heating your home, and so much more. It's not right that individuals and families in northern communities are negatively impacted because of this regressive tax. And you know what, Speaker? Instead of supporting Northern Ontario, the previous Liberal government, supported by the NDP, spent more time insulting this region, calling it no man's land. Unlike other parts of our province, the North faces unique barriers regarding fuel costs that need to be understood and respected. The opposition Liberals and NDP downplaying the carbon tax's impact on Northern Ontario is disrespectful to all of its residents. Speaker, can the minister Question. please elaborate on the detrimental effects that the carbon tax is having on the people, communities and businesses of the North? Thank you. Minister of Northern Development, Minister of Indigenous Affairs. With all due respect, it isn't just the fact that they downplayed it. They voted in favour of this carbon tax. That's a matter of record in this legislature and in Ottawa, Mr. Speaker. And no place, no place could this be on higher profile than the isolated communities in Northern Ontario. Now, this government understood that. We put a reduction in fuel costs into the isolated communities uh, in the last legislative session. 
the member from Kiwetna, how did he vote against that, colleagues? These are carrying people and goods to his isolated communities. He voted against it, Mr. Speaker, as did his other colleagues who have isolated communities in their ridings. Mr. Speaker, they already have some of the highest costs for groceries, goods, and importantly, diesel fuel for the last remaining communities in Northern Ontario who deserve Spons. an electricity corridor. I know the Minister of Energy is listening hard to that, Mr. Speaker. This carbon tax is very expensive for our isolated communities. It's time to scrap the tax. Sure. Next question, Member for Hamilton West and Castor Dundas. My question to the Premier. According to FOI documents released yesterday, in an email dated November 4th, the day the Greenbelt changes were announced, Ryan Amato asked Ministry staff for a map to make sure that Greenbelt land in Nobleton could be developed. This land was not technically removed from the Greenbelt, but development was enabled through the Ministry's changes to York Region's official plan, also announced on November 4th. Mr. Amato wrote, and I quote, P.O., Premier's office, asked me for a picture to make sure it's captured. So, why was the Premier's office so interested in these Nobleton Greenbelt lands? Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Uh, the best of my understanding of the Nobleton Greenbelt lands uh, were not uh, rezoned for uh, housing. Supplementary question. The member Back to the Premier. These Greenbelt lands appear to correspond to lands owned by Flato Developments, owned by the Premier's friend, Shakir Ramtula. The Integrity Commissioner's report described how Ryan Amato decided to open these Greenbelt lands for development using changes to York's official plan, rather than changes to the Greenbelt boundaries. Through you, Speaker, did the Premier or any of his staff direct Mr. Amato with respect to Flato's Greenbelt lands in Nobleton, yes or no? Mr. Mr. Affairs and Housing. Uh, again, no changes were made to these lands, uh, Mr. Speaker. The next question, the member for Kingston and the Islands. Mr. Speaker, yesterday a Freedom of Information document gave us a glimpse into the $8.3 billion Greenbelt and urban Order. boundary scandal. We learned that the Premier's office, on or before October 26, 2022, was worried about the public reaction to Greenbelt removals. Staff notes recorded that the minister wanted to, quote, rip the Band-Aid off, but the PO doesn't want that. He wants safeguards, end quote. While the Premier's office seems to have known what was going on in October last year or before, the Premier himself says he didn't know anything until that November. If the former housing minister resigned because he didn't know what was going on in his office and his head was in the sand, Will the Premier step down for the same thing? Mr. Speaker, what did the Premier know and when did he know it? Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Thank you uh, very much, Mr. Speaker. I think uh, both the Integrity Commissioner and the Auditor General were very clear uh, that, uh, the of, uh, that the Premier had no role in that. Uh, at the opposite uh, time, though, Mr. Speaker, the Premier has been very clear that we have to continue on our, uh, on our goal of building 1.5 million homes for the people of the province of Ontario. It is no secret that when we took over government in 2018, we were faced with a province that had crippling debt, crippling taxes, crippling uh, uh, red tape. We are in a housing crisis because of the obstacles that the Liberals, supported by the NDP, had put in the way of building homes. Now, we've started to release all of that, Mr. Speaker. What we're doing with our housing supply action plans is working. We have uh, the highest amount of purpose-built rental starts uh, in over 30 years, Mr. Speaker, and the same great news for, uh, for new home starts. Listen, we're not going to stop working to get kids out of their basement apartments and Bonds. into their first homes. That is our job and we will get it done for them. Supplementary question. No, the next. No, supplementary question. Sorry. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, on October 31st, 2018, the Premier stood in this House and said, quote, we have the most ethical, most transparent, most accountable caucus, not just cabinet, but caucus I've ever seen in politics. They make sure they don't make the backroom deals that we've seen in other governments, end quote. So, Mr. Speaker, does the Premier consider his team's actions on the Green Belt over the last couple of years ethical? Mr. Municipal Affairs and Housing. 
Speaker, you know what we're doing in this side of the House and the Conservative majority on that side of the House? We're rebuilding a province that, under 15 years of Liberal government, supported by the NDP, was literally decimated. Now they finally started to come around to understand just how bad a government they were. When we brought a motion forward on the carbon tax, you'll remember this, Speaker, we have said since day one the carbon tax would kill the economy, that it would cost every single Ontarian far too much, Mr. Speaker. They disagreed with it. This Premier Order. brought the federal government to court to stop that tax. Now we've finally seen a split in the Liberal Party, Mr. Speaker. Half of them want to continue the tax. The others want to kill the tax, Order. Mr. Speaker. They know that we're on the right page. We will not stop ensuring that we reverse everything that that Liberal government did, cutting Response. taxes, reducing red tape, building more homes for the people of the province of Ontario. They were incredible failures. We'll get the job. The next question, the member for Burlington. Speaker, my question is to the Associate Minister of Transportation. Since the implementation of the carbon tax, the people of Ontario have been paying more and more every single day for food, for services, and for transportation. They've been forced to pay much more to fuel their cars. The carbon tax is making life more expensive for millions of people in Ontario. While our government showed much needed leadership and reduced the gasoline tax, the federal government did not. Instead, they increased fuel and gasoline costs by more by 14 cents, forcing individuals and families to, make, to pay more at the pumps because of this regressive tax. Doing so hurts our drivers and negatively impacts our economy. Speaker, can the Associate Minister please explain the negative impact of the carbon tax and what our government is doing to mitigate this unfair policy? The Associate Minister of Transportation. Speaker, the member from Burlington is correct, and thank you for her advocacy and the great job that she is doing. The, the federal carbon tax is draining the pockets of hard-working drivers. It hurts workers who want to drive to the office yep. and get back home. It's unfair for truckers who transport critical goods across our province, Mr. Speaker. That is why I'm proud that our government opposed this harmful carbon tax. And unfortunately, Mr. Speaker, the Liberal NDP had no problem supporting this tax, all while saying yes. no to any of the measures yes. our government is bringing to provide financial relief to Ontarians. Yeah. Mr. Speaker, let's not forget that they said no to our government's sure. fantastic removal of tolls on Highway 12 and Highway 18, Mr. Speaker. By removing these tolls, the Response. average commuters can save $300 on the 418 and $150 on the 412 every month, Mr. Speaker. Unlike Liberals and NDP and their carbon tax, our government is making life more affordable. Thank you. The supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. High gas prices caused by the federal carbon tax are making life more difficult for people in my riding. The federal government has increased the carbon tax on gasoline five times so far, and they are planning another seven increases by 2030. This is wrong and unfair and will hurt many hardworking individuals and families who are already struggling. Cancelling the carbon tax will save money at the pumps for our drivers by putting more money back in their pockets. Individuals and families are looking to our government to help during these challenging times Order. to provide support so that life is more affordable. Speaker, can the Associate Minister please explain how removing the carbon tax will make life easier for Ontarians and how our government is making everyday life more affordable for drivers in our province? Stop the clock. Stop the clock. Um, we're in the midst of a question period. A member for Waterloo, the government house leader, if they wish to have a conversation, um, could perhaps uh, do so outside the chamber, if they wish. Restart the clock. The Associate Minister of Transportation. Speaker, the removing the carbon tax would be a long overdue victory for drivers in this province. The hardworking people of Ontario would no longer be overburdened when paying for gas, food, transit, and other everyday essentials. In the meantime, Mr. Speaker, we are finding concrete ways to fight against the negative impacts 
of the federal carbon tax by putting more money back into people's pocket, Mr. Speaker. That is why I'm proud, under the leadership of Premier Ford, our government eliminated the license plate renewal fees. In fact, it's because of our work on this policy alone that over 2.2 billion went directly back into the pockets of over 7 million hardworking Ontarians, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, we are fighting the federal carbon tax that opposition, liberals and NDP continue to support. Our government will continue to put more money back into people's pockets, Mr. Speaker. Response. It's time to scrap the tax. Thank you. Hey, hey. Next, the member for Toronto St. Paul's. Thanks, Speaker. Good morning. Uh, my question is to the Premier. Can you shut so I can speak? Thanks. My question is to the Order. Stop the clock. So I'm going to remind order. Yes. I'll remind all members to make their comments through the chair. Thank you, sir. Order. Order. Start the clock. Member for Toronto St. Paul's. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. This government's cut of $5 million this year to the Ontario Arts Council and continued failure to match funding to inflation is being felt deeply across Ontario, and Toronto St. Paul's is no exception. This year, Ballet Jorgen's funding was cut by 16 per cent. As a result, they have been forced to cut staff and free programming that serves racialized, northern, rural, and underinvested in communities all because this government failed to deliver adequate funding to see it continue. My question is to the Premier. Will you commit to restoring their funding to meet inflation so that communities for which the arts is a social determinant of health and well-being can thrive? Thank you. Minister of Tourism, Culture and Sport. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and, and I thank you for the question. In 23-24, Ontario Arts Council will be provided with $60 million of operating allocation. And to confirm, previous year was also $60 million, and that has great impact in the community, in arts organizations, across all communities. As a matter of fact, Mr. Speaker, it's over 220 communities and helping support through grants, 500 arts organizations and individual artists. When it comes to the specifics uh, of the question, since 2018, Bella Yorge, and I hope I pronounced that correctly, has received over 1.4 million in support through the OSC, Ontario Arts Council, the Ontario Cultural Attractions Fund, and of course, special investments through the COVID funding. And I'd like to reinforce that what the OAC does in all of our communities is supports artists, young people, Fox. and thrives and helps communities thrive, Mr. Speaker, and that's really important across the board, including tourism. A supplementary question, member for Thomas St. Paul. Speaker, the government seems to care about our big eight art organizations, but not so much about our small and medium-sized community arts organizations. Back to the Premier. I wrote to the Premier and Minister outlining just how important ballet organs programming is for its dancers as well as its Ontarians. Because investment into arts organizations is a guaranteed return, both economically and socially, as a harm reduction strategy, social determinant of health, and building block uh, to our jobs, our, our economy, our tourism, the whole nine, just to name a few, our province is better for it and will pay the price without a properly funded arts wow. sector. My question is back to the Premier. Will he commit to Ontario's economic future by restoring Ontario Arts Council funding in line with inflation to meet the needs Question. of Ontario artists and organizations who depend on it for their livelihood? Thank you. The Minister of Tourism, Culture and Sport. Uh, Mr. Speaker, and again, thank you for the question. Restoring, I, I believe I said $60 million previously and for this year, and I don't think that's a cut. I just I want to double check. And I also, I also take exception when we're talking about impacting communities in a positive way. Youth in communities, arts, artists, 
the cultural part of what's going on. And you, and there's a suggestion, and I, I want to make sure this is correct, Mr. Speaker. There's a suggestion that since 2018, 1.4 million dollars in funding isn't Order. enough. Boy, I'll tell you what. There's a lot of organizations out there, Mr. Speaker, that wish they had half that money and do it mostly within the community. So I think that's a little bit of a slap in the face, but Order. that's okay. We're big boys over here. Order. Stop the clock. Stop the clock. The House will come to order. Order. Restart the clock. The next question, the member for Algoma, Manitoula. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Health. Access to health care in the North often means traveling long distances to get to the care you need. In my writing, people often must travel to Health Science North in Sudbury, to St. Marie, Thunder Bay, or to Southern Ontario for surgeries, special appointments, and diagnostics. We rely on the Northern Health Travel Grant to make sure that no one is denied the care they need because of costs. However, my office is often and constantly hearing from constituents who are waiting weeks, if not months, on end to get a meager reimbursement that barely covers a portion of the cost to travel and the accommodations. To the minister, does she believe that people in Northern Ontario Question. have the same right to access health care as the rest of Ontario. The Deputy Premier and Minister of Health. Thank you. I do, and not only do we believe that, but we're actually making changes. You know, since 2018, we have expanded almost uh, 50, 49 MRI machines that will be operating in the province of Ontario in communities closer to home. Why do we do that, Speaker? Because we want to make sure that people have access to those diagnostic tools as close to home as reasonable. And specifically speaking on the Northern Health Travel Grant, we now have 95 percent of individuals who submit for a travel grant uh, get that reimbursement within 30 business days. We have made changes that make improvements, and we will continue to do that because we have a plan and it is working. Supplementary question. Again, to the Minister of Health, the fact of the matter is that Northern Health Travel Grant is failing to address health inequities in Northern Ontario, and this government is content to sit on the sideline while it does. A constituent in my writing, Heather Wilson from Espanola, must travel to Toronto for medical treatment regularly. She wrote to my office last spring saying, I have had to navigate the Northern Ontario Travel Grant system, the outdated sy system of printing out the forms, getting the referring doctor and the referred doctor to fill out these forms, and then mailing it in and waiting for reimbursements of costs seem archaic to me. Northerners have the right to the same resources in a prompt matter, and, current, and the current Northern Health Travel Grant does not do this for Northern Ontario residents. Will the minister support and pass my bill to improve the Northern Health Travel Grant so that it finally works for Northerners? Minister of Health. As I said, in fact, we have made um, improvements. One, of course, is allowing auto deposits so that constituents can access and get that money back. But I want to talk about the expansions that have happened in Northern Ontario. You know, whether it's returning the Ontario Northland for the first time and allowing constituents and others access, whether it is a brand new hospital that I had the opportunity to visit and talk to the Winnebago uh, hospital leadership to make sure we are making those investments in Northern Ontario, whether it is an expansion of a community health team in the members' own riding that we did this summer. We are making sure that individuals in Northern Ontario, rural Ontario, all across Ontario have better access to health care closer to home. Thank you. Next question, the member for Carleton. Mr. Speaker, <clears throat> Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Associate Minister of Small Business. The carbon tax raises the price on everything, especially for small businesses like those in my riding of Carleton and across the province who have no choice but to either absorb the loss or pass on the cost to customers. 
Business owners, especially restaurateurs, are the heartbeat of communities across Ontario and are the back backbone of our economic engine. They are rightfully concerned about the financial impact that the federal carbon tax continues to have on their bottom line. Unfortunately, the opposition Liberals and NDP continue to ignore and disrespect small businesses' concerns about the impact this regressive tax has on them. Speaker, through you, can the Associate Minister please share what she has heard from small business owners and entrepreneurs regarding the impact that the carbon tax is having? Thank you. The Associate Minister for Small Business. Thank you, Speaker. I want to thank the great member from Carlton for her great work in the writing and for the question. Speaker, just yesterday I met with Restaurants Canada to discuss the continued economic recovery of the food service industry. They made it unequivocally clear that owners are facing hardship over the federal carbon tax. For years, the NDP and the Liberals failed to stand up in this House and recognize what their constituents had been saying all along, Speaker. That from the farm to the table, the carbon tax was a disaster for small businesses in our province. Speaker, restaurants and small business owners cannot simply pass these unnecessary costs on to consumers, forcing them to cut staff instead. Meanwhile, the federal government turns a blind eye to their struggles. Speaker, this tax is the difference between doors open and doors closed. Response. We demand better than empty words from those who champion this joint Liberal NDP tax grab. Thank you. Supplementary question. Back to Minister Clark. Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the Minister. As we all know, small businesses are the backbone of our local economy, especially in my riding of Carleton. However, Many local businesses are already feeling financial pressure due to higher costs associated with inflation and ongoing supply chain challenges. I often speak with business owners who are concerned about the impact that the carbon tax is having on their business operations. Many of these owners are still struggling to recover, and they worry about the impact increasing carbon taxes will have on their ability to continue operating. The opposition Liberals and NDP need to hear their concerns and support our small business owners by opposing this regressive and harmful tax. Speaker, through you, can the minister please share what impact the federal carbon tax increases have had on small businesses in our province? Thank you. The Associate Minister for Small Business. Thank you, Speaker, and again to the member from Carlton who works extremely hard for her small businesses in her riding. Speaker. Yesterday, I also had the pleasure of speaking to representatives from the Canadian Federation of Independent Business. They expressed to me that while our small businesses pay close to half the billions collected in carbon taxes each year, only a tiny fraction of that money comes back their way. Even worse, Funds intended to help small businesses with carbon costs have been taken away and thrown back into the ever-expanding taxation. All the while, the opposition parties have cheered on these policies without care for how hard they hit family businesses and people working from paycheck to paycheck. Order. Only, only this Premier and this government Spons. had the backs of entrepreneurs in this province from the start. We call on the spooky NDP and Liberals to stop grandstanding and, for once, stand up to their federal counterparts and demand that they act. Stop the clock. Stop the clock. Stop the clock. Stop the clock. If it wasn't Halloween, that remark might not have been acceptable. <laughs> Start the clock. The next question, Member for Kiwetnon. Uh, miigwech, Speaker. Uh, good morning. Uh, my question is to the Premier. Great. I've been uh, speaking with First Nation leaders across Ontario, and they are frustrated and confused about Ontario's ongoing consultation of the Métis Nation of Ontario within First Nation territories. First Nations uh, affected by these decisions have, uh, have asked the government repeatedly uh, to share the evidence Ontario is using to support this recognition. Ontario still hasn't shared that evidence. 
will Ontario share the evidence as asked? Yes or no? Minister of Northern Development and Minister of Indigenous Affairs. Speaker, on, uh, the Government of Ontario is guided by uh, some legal decisions and we make it our business to engage Indigenous peoples across, across the province, Mr. Speaker. I've never seen a leader of a political party be more accessible to Indigenous leaders, business leaders and political leaders, Mr. Speaker, to fundamentally change the dialogue, Mr. Speaker, to create opportunities for Indigenous uh, populations across the province, to settle treaty disputes, uh, Mr. Speaker, to settle flooding and land claims, Mr. Speaker, and ensure that First Nations communities and the Indigenous population across pro uh, the province of Ontario writ large has as the tools they need for greater economic prosperity. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Mr. <laughs> Supplementary. Uh, speaker, uh, the, uh, the Ontario Court of Appeal recently uh, provided direction on consultation in the recent White Duck decision. The Ontario government must consult with First Nations about issues affecting their traditional territories, including when it recognizes the Métis Nation of Ontario communities in those territories. Will this government uh, follow this decision, yes or no? Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. We're very proud of the fact that we have increased uh, the number of resource revenue sharing agreements available for Indigenous communities, Mr. Speaker. It's just another example of how we endeavour to ensure that First Nations communities have the economic tools that they need, Mr. Speaker, to engage in a resource-based economy in Northern Ontario, Mr. Speaker, and as, as, as an addition to that, to, to complement it, if you will, to be involved in the sustainable, responsible development uh, in forestry and in mining. These are game changers in Northern Ontario, Mr. Speaker. We will always live up to the standard of a duty to consult, and we make it our business to ensure that First Nations communities across this province, Mr. Speaker, play an important and equitable role in all of the economic opportunities Response. available now and in the future of this great province. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The next question, the member for Scarborough Agent Court. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the elder statesman of Scarborough and the Minister for Seniors and Accessibility. Across our province, many seniors are currently struggling to stretch their incomes. The cost of food, as well as everyday goods and services keep rising. For seniors with limited incomes, the carbon tax is creating even more difficulty and hardship. It is not right or fair that seniors should have to be worried about the extra burden that the carbon tax is placing on them. Unlike the opposition Liberals and NDP who support the carbon tax, Question. our government is focused on making life more affordable for our seniors. Speaker, can the minister please explain what impact the carbon tax is having on seniors in our province? The minister responsible for seniors and accessibility. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you to hardworking member for the important question. The federal government's carbon tax is a worry for our seniors. Every product we have in Ontario is affected by the carbon tax. Seniors across Ontario are very concerned that taxes will keep going up and life will be harder for them. Seniors should not have to struggle to pay high costs for food, heating, and the things they need. Our government is working for Ontario seniors so they can live comfortably and with dignity. That is why our government opposes the federal carbon tax. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for that response. 
under the strong leadership of the Premier and this Minister, our government is respecting our seniors by opposing the federal carbon tax that the opposition Liberals and NDP support. However, life is simply more unaffordable today because of the imposition of the federal carbon tax. It is harmful that tax that is creating hardship for seniors by driving up the cost on everything. Seniors are also concerned that higher heating costs due to the federal carbon tax will impact senior centers and organizations that support them. Speaker, can the minister please elaborate on how the federal carbon Question. taxes will impact organizations that support our seniors? Thank yes. you. Mr. Seniors and Accessibility. Thank you, Speaker. Ontario seniors should not be taxed more. The federal carbon tax should be cancelled because it hurts Ontario seniors' centers. Our seniors in these, these programs to remain active, socially engaged in their communities. Without this support, many seniors will be socially isolated and this will harm their health. Our government takes the well-being well -being of our seniors very seriously. We will continue to support our seniors and to advocate for them. Thank you. The next question, the member for Nickelback. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Health. This morning in the media studio, my colleague, the MPP from Niagara Falls, and I were joined by Erin Harris. She is the president of the Ontario Nurses Association, who stated, and I quote, our publicly funded hospitals and long-term care homes are seeing their budget drained by these greedy, for-profit nursing agency owners who bill obscene amounts of money. Is the Minister of Health taking any action whatsoever to stop for-profit nursing agency from making millions of dollars in profit at the expense of quality care in our hospital and long-term care homes? Minister of Health. Thank you, Speaker. What our government is doing is expanding the health care workforce across the spectrum, whether that is residency spots, that are available in every single medical school in the province of Ontario, including Northern Ontario School of Medicine, so that we are training more physicians and, and ensuring that they are in the system. Whether that is as of right rules that ensure that medically uh, regulated professionals who want to come to Ontario and practice in Ontario have the ability to do that immediately while their license gets transferred. You know, we're making the investments to expand our health care workforce. The member opposite is concerned about something that, frankly, is less than 2 percent, and a tool, I might add, that is very valuable for rural and northern Ontario. So I'm happy that we're making those investments Response. and expanding, and I will not take that tool away from northern Ontario. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Supplementary. Speaker. Dave Verge, the Vice President of QP, Ontario, Hospital, Hospital, Ontario Council of Hospital Unions, was also present. He said, and again, I quote, agency staff are paid as much as 300 percent more than hospital staff, which is contributing to the staffing crisis with stark consequences for patient care. He, give, he gave many examples of the effect of quality care, of having staffing agency, more and more of them in our hospital and long-term care. Will this government take action to ensure that healthcare dollars are paying for quality care, not lining the pockets of private nursing agency executives? Speaker, I am frankly very concerned that the member opposite knows full well that every single nurse practitioner, RN, 
is regulated by their colleges in the province of Ontario, regardless of who their employer is. And to suggest anything other than that is putting fear in people's minds, and it is wrong. So I want to be very clear with the people of Ontario. Every single nurse that is practicing in Ontario, whether it is in hospital, in our public uh, health units, in our long-term care facilities, in our retirement homes, in our home and community care system, is regulated under the College of Nurses of Ontario, has always been and will continue to do so. I am focused on expanding the ability and access to ensure that we have sufficient Response. health human resources in the province of Ontario. I only wish the member opposite had the same focus. Yeah, Next question, the member for Essex. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The carbon tax is hurting families, it's hurting farmers, and it's hurting businesses in Ontario. The carbon tax raises the price of everything, Order. especially for small businesses who have no choice but either suffer the loss or pass it on to their customers. Unlike the opposition, NDP and Liberals, we in this party have always known that the carbon tax would drive up costs for everybody. Speaker, can the Minister of Energy please explain the impact of the carbon tax having on hard-working families in the province of Ontario? Minister of Energy. Yeah, great question from the member uh, from Essex who's standing up for his residence down in southwestern Ontario. Absolutely. We've heard from all of our members and our ministers today on just what an impact the carbon tax is having on constituents in their communities and small businesses in their communities. Mr. Speaker, uh, the President of the Treasury Board and I were talking earlier this morning about a request from Dalhousie University uh, to ask the Bank of Canada to take a look at just how much impact the increased carbon tax was having on the rate of inflation across the country, Mr. Speaker. And uh, they revised their numbers, and the figure is a staggering 0.6 per cent, Mr. Speaker. And when considering the compounding impact of the carbon tax, the Bank of Canada now contends that it contributes contributes a whopping 16 per cent, Mr. Speaker, to the rate of inflation. The federal government has to wake up. Response. My counterpart, the federal minister of Enercan, said yesterday that there weren't going to be any more carve-outs. They have to start being the government of Canada and treating all Canadians fairly, Mr. Speaker. The supplementary question. Mr. Speaker, as the Premier has said, the delivery of every product we have in this province is being affected by one of the most harmful and regressive taxes this country has ever seen. It's a useless tax, and that's the carbon tax. Speaker, the most concerning part about the Order. carbon tax is that it will only get worse. The federal government and opposition, Liberal and NDP, want to triple this regressive tax, <laughs> triple it by 2030. I absolutely agree with the Premier's concerns about this tax because while our government has remained laser-focused on lowering costs, the carbon tax is working against us. Can the Minister please share his views on the negative impact the carbon tax is having on so many Ontario? Energy. Thanks again uh, to the member from Essex. You know, the federal government is digging in on the carbon tax, as, as a matter of fact, Mr. Speaker, at a time when affordability is the key issue at the door. We go door to door and we talk to our constituents all the time. And the biggest thing they're talking to us about is just how unaffordable it is to live in this country these days. Our province has done everything we can. We've removed the stickers for license plate fees. We've got rid of the tolls. We're lowering the price of gas by 10 cents a litre. So many different programs to like make life more affordable for the people of Ontario, but the federal government keeps digging in. And then they announce a break for Atlantic Canada, Mr. Speaker, but they are the government of Canada. I have some advice for them. If they don't make a change and provide the same carve out for the people all across Canada, Response. including in Ontario, they're going to end up like this bunch did, like Kathleen Wynne and the Liberals did, Mr. Speaker. They'll lose party status on Parliament Hill.
concludes our question period for this morning.